Hey friends, I got a question in my email asking me a simple question, or maybe not so simple. May I please ask you a last question? It is regarding an article I read recently. Intelligent design proponents often use junk DNA functions as evidence for ID. I know that they are dishonest and advocate nonsense, but if you have time to look at the article below, may I ask for your opinion? And they give me a link to an article on uh, evolution news and views. Okay, sure, I'll take a quick look. It's a Discovery Institute, so I had little hope there would be at all intelligent commentary. But I was surprised at how bad it is. I'm reading it and realize that the Discovery Institute was pulling an auto. You know what I mean. The assassin in the movie A Fish Called Wanda, who was so incredibly stupid yet also pretentious, thinking he was an intellectual. You may recall the exchange. Wanda says, You think you're an intellectual, don't you, ape? And Otto replies, Apes don't read philosophy. And Wanda fires back with, Yes, they do. They just don't understand it. That's my summary. The Discovery Institute reads papers in cell. They just don't understand them. They ought to be embarrassed if they weren't so shameless. Okay, I can explain it, but there's a problem. I have to provide a fair bit of technical background so you can see what's wrong with their take. They rely on that. They provide a bunch of complicated techno babble and emphatic confidence to make you think they're super smart. But don't be fooled. This particular article is titled, Caltech Finds Amazing Role for Non-Coding DNA. It's a summary of a real genuine science article published in the journal Cell. And what it's doing is taking a legit science article and putting a creationist spin on it. It's not clear who wrote the Discovery Institute article, but whoever it was didn't actually understand the article. So here's their introduction. So the Discovery Institute says, scientists at Caltech may have sounded the final death knell for the junk DNA myth. If only Dan Grar had known this years ago, it might have saved a lot of wasted rhetoric. ENCODE, readers recall, found that 80% of the genome is transcribed, even if only a small part codes for the proteins. The functions of those non-coding regions were only hinted at. Now the windows are opening an organization so all-encompassing for all those non-coding RNA transcripts, it is truly mind-boggling what goes on in the nucleus of the cell. Oh boy, this is very strange. What the Discovery Institute article is, is yet another attempt to debunk the idea of junk DNA. But the cell article is not about junk DNA and says nothing relevant to the creationist arguments about junk DNA. For some reason, creationists detest the idea that not all DNA has a specific function, and I'm not certain why. After all, their designer can do anything. Why not just say that he intentionally left lots of room in the code for expansion, maybe? Why not just call it the white space around the important content? Or call it the artistic filigree he put there because he, in his unknowable ways, found it beautiful. It really would be that easy. But instead, they have to insist that it is all biologically functional. It's almost as if they fear we might notice that their sacred holy books are maybe 5% good art and humane advice and 95% flaming, demented, useless, inconsistent junk, too. Okay, they do love that awful ENCODE study, which claimed that at least 80% of the genome was functional by an odd definition of functionality that no one accepts. The ENCODE studies argued that any bit of DNA that was transcribed into RNA counted as functional, no matter how short or rare it was, and ignored the possibility of spurious transcription. There are very few biologists who accept that nonsensical idea, but the creationists ate it up. If you mention junk DNA to them anymore, they immediately bring up ENCODE in a kind of spastic knee-jerk reaction, even if they don't understand it. They also have a special loathing for Dan Grar, who has been particularly eloquent 
and historically literate in his arguments against every scrap of the genome being functional. There are limits to how many genes, genes that can be based on the mutation rate and the ability of recombination to purify deleterious alleles. We've known since Haldane and Wright that humans ought to have approximately 20,000 genes, a number that has been confirmed by the Human Genome Project, and that making any greater proportion of the genome functional would impose an excessive genetic load on the species. It is mathematically impossible for the claims of the ID creationists to be true. By now they're claiming that they've got a Grar killer paper in their hands. It's almost embarrassing how irrelevant this paper is to their claim. So here it is. Here's the paper. RNA promotes the formation of spatial compartments in the nucleus by Quinodos and others. Uh, and the abstract reads, RNA, DNA, and protein molecules are highly organized within three-dimensional 3D structures in the nucleus. Although RNA has been proposed to play a role in nuclear organization, exploring this has been challenging because existing methods cannot measure higher-order RNA and DNA contexts with, within 3D structures. To address this, we developed RNA and DNA Sprite, RD Sprite, to comprehensively map the spatial organization of RNA and DNA. These maps reveal higher order RNA chromatin structures associated with the three major classes of nuclear function, RNA processing, heterochromatin assembly, and gene regulation. These data demonstrate that hundreds of NC RNAs form high concentration territories throughout the nucleus, that specific RNAs are required to recruit various regulators into these territories and that the, uh, these RNAs can shape long-range DNA contacts, heterochromatin assembly, and gene expression. These results demonstrate a mechanism where RNAs form high concentration territories, bind to diffusible regulators, and guide them into compartments to regulate essential nuclear functions. Okay, there's functional organization in the nucleus. No one is surprised by this. Uh, but it's not light reading. There's a lot of quantitative molecular biology and detailed analysis. And I'll be honest, my eyes glazed over here and there in the manuscript because it is, it is very dense and detailed. To dis distill it down to the important points, though, they're saying a couple of things. One, nuclear DNA is organized and shows a specific functional arrangement. This is not entirely new. I was reading about the three-dimensional structure of folded R DNA in my nucleus way back in the 1980s, but this does provide more sophisticated methods of imaging it. The second point is that one of the agents of this structure is long, non-coding RNA. That is, RNA that isn't translated to protein, but functions to link DNA and proteins into loops in associated active regions. This RNA works like little bungee cords to tie related elements together and to help recruit proteins and other RNAs into the region of active transcription. So here's their model. So non-coding RNA, NC RNA, aggregates around RNA polymerase as it works. That's the seed step. And it forms a mass that can bind to other regions of DNA and to proteins binding them together into a compartment that then promotes further synthesis of our mRNA and presumably enhances the efficiency of that synthesis. I believe it. The data looks good. It looks like a reasonable model. It's uh, not at all unexpected. I mean, this is not surprising at all to biologists. We've known for a long, long time that DNA is organized in the nucleus, for example. There are structures called nuclear pore complexes where arrays of proteins in the nucleus bind to newly synthesized RNA and expedite its export directly to pores in the nuclear membrane and then to the cytoplasm for translation. But, I ask you, what does this have to do with the proportion of junk DNA in the genome? It doesn't, not one bit. Whatever hack wrote the Discovery Institute article didn't understand the paper. I think they saw nothing but that it was about a novel function for non-coding RNA and that they leapt to the conclusion that this is about junk DNA. Non-coding is not a synonym for junk DNA, although creationists think so. It, it's one of those, those little tells that you will notice 
among creationists when they think non-coding equals junk DNA, then you know you're dealing with somebody who doesn't know what they're talking about. So, to give you a little background, a little context, let's take a look at a comprehensive review of non-coding RNA. Uh, this is an excellent review article by Palazzo and Lee that I recommend highly if you want to figure out what the real story is about nCRNA. Um, it's open access, and I will include a link to it down below. Okay, so here's what it says. Starting with the discovery of transfer RNA and ribosomal RNA in the 1950s, non-coding RNAs, nCRNAs, with biological roles have been known for close to 60 years. Even in the early 70s and early 80s, um, the late 70s and the early 80s, the existence of other functional nCRNAs was known, including RNAs P, SNRNAs, and 7SL, the RNA component, component of the signal recognition particle. Uh, you see what this is saying here is this, this does not surprise us. We've known about functional non-coding RNAs, that is, non-coding RNAs that are not junk, definitely not junk, for ages, for decades. And now the Discovery Institute wants to claim that the idea of functional non-coding RNAs was derived from intelligent design thinking. But actually, it has been common knowledge in the biology, that is, the real biology, community for decades. It's so old that it's what I learned as an undergraduate, which was ages ago. Palazzo and Lee go on to point out that this notion of persuasive transcription has also been around for a long time. And that there are a few people, yeah, a few, like John Maddock, who still promote this idea that every bit of the genome is transcribed and therefore functional which is absurd and also contrary to everything we know about evolutionary biology. This idea was epitomized by the ENCODE consortium, which claimed to have assigned biochemical functions for 80% of the genome. Yeah, you'll hear that number a lot talking to creationists. Others have disagreed, pointing out that the vast majority of these novel transcripts are present at low levels and that the term function had been misappropriated. Yes, and that's what I think. It's pretty hard to argue that RNA polymerase is flawless and perfect and never errs in making RNA transcripts. Uh, so, Palazzo and Lee, again, it is important to recognize that the pervasive transcription associated with the human genome is entirely consistent with our understanding of biochemistry. Although RNA polymerases prefer to start at transcription at promoter regions, they do have a low probability of initiating transcription on any accessible RNA. Indeed, it has been observed that most nucleosome-free DNA is transcribed in vivo, and that many random pieces of DNA can promote transcription by recruiting transcription factors. Yeah, so it's going on all the time. But let's focus on the implied claims of the Discovery Institute. Is this discovery by Quinidos and others a role for some nCRNAs? Does it represent a revelation that shows the human genome is mostly or even entirely functional? I don't think so. Here's the key point from Palazzo and Lee. Uh, long non-coding RNAs are only a tiny fraction of the genome. So identifying a few LNC RNAs that have a function, no matter how important that function might be, cannot tell you that the whole genome is functional. So as of spring 2014, the LNC Epidia website has compiled a list of 21,000 human LNC RNAs with an average length of about 1 KB. These would originate from less than 1% of the human genome. Needless to say, this is a very small fraction of the total. Even if we compiled all of the putative LNC RNAs using the most optimistic analysis, all the putative LNC RNAs would still be transcribed from at most 2% of the genome. Yeah, we're a long way from saying that 100% of the genome, or even 80%, is functional. And they go on in brief. In summary, our best candidates for novel functional NC RNAs LNC RNAs and eRNAs arise from only a minute fraction of the genome. 
Again, it appears that the vast majority of the genome that falls outside of these loci is transcribed into junk RNA that is present at very low levels at steady state. So LNC RNAs are less than 1% of the genome. Even if every single one of them was demonstrated to be performing an essential function, they are a small drop in the bucket of the entire genome. And that functionality has not been demonstrated except in a few rare examples. So thus far, only a small minority of LNC RNAs have been shown to be important for organismal development, cell physiology, and or homeostasis. As of December 2014, the LNC RNA database, a repository of LNC RNAs curated from evidence supported by the literature, lists only 166 biologically validated LNC RNAs in humans. In addition, there are so-called eRNAs, which according to Phantom 5, come from an additional 43,000 loci. Oh, that sounds like a lot. Except, however, at an average length of 250 nucleotides, they would be made from 0.34% of the human genome. Again, these are very small numbers. Okay, the Quinidose paper then would have added a few other examples of LNC RNAs to that 166. A few more. That's all, that's all it really means. And this is an interesting function they found, but still, uh, it's not going to radically change our views of the functionality of the genome. Uh, so the Discovery Institute article concludes by saying, this is a paper to remember. It shows in hindsight the fruitfulness of the ID perspective over the evolutionary one. Evolutionary thinking dismissed these non-coding RNAs as junk. ID thinking would have approached the unknown with a premise, if something works, it's not happening by accident. Uh, the second and third sentences are outright lies. Uh, the Quinidose paper was not inspired by intelligent design creationism. It fits well within the context of the existing evolutionary theory. It builds on prior work on molecular and evolutionary biology that emerged out of the 1950s. So, no, that's false. Um, the, the, in, the evolution perspective was the fruitful one here. And then evolutionary biology does not, I repeat, does not dismiss non-coding RNAs as junk. Evolutionary thinking approaches these scraps of RNA with the premise that function can't be assumed, it must be demonstrated. Okay, that's it. That's, that's all I've got to say. The Discovery Institute mangled and misinterpreted an article in a science journal to twist to support their silly agenda. News at 11. This is, they, they do this all the time. Seriously, you cannot trust anything out of the Evolution News and Views site. It's, it's the entire thing is like this. They tout some paper that they find somewhere that mentions something about functionality and make sweeping conclusions from it. So, yeah, just ignore them. They're useless. Okay, but don't ignore these people. These are my patrons. These are the people who support me on Patreon. Uh, you can do it, too. Yeah. There's there's the address, patreon.com slash pzmyers. I, I would appreciate anybody who comes and joins that group. I only ask a flat fee of a dollar a month to support. Well, initially it was to support us in our legal stru struggles, but now uh, it's also to support my lab work. So if you want to pay for science at a really low rate, just go ahead, join Patreon. Oh, but wait, there's more. That was only half of my pa patrons on that previous slide. Here's the rest of them. Yeah, I got a bunch. Always room for more. So these are the people who have been so kind to support me in all my efforts and uh, doing really well here. I'm, I greatly appreciate it. So uh, you could join, as I said, but it's okay if you don't want to. You know, I know it's t times are tough right now, so coughing up a dollar a month uh, may be something you'd rather not do right now. But... You could help just by liking and sub subscribing this video, and that will contribute to my self-esteem and well-being and help me grow the channel. 
Uh, I, I hear there are wonderful things that happen when you hit, hit 10,000 subscribers. So I'm, I'm aiming for that now. I'm, I'm only about, what is it, 1,500 subscribers away? Yeah. Piece of cake. Okay, we'll let you go there. Thank you very much for stopping by, and we'll talk to you later.